Innate helps companies avoid project surprises, make better informed decisions, share knowledge, and deliver better outcomes. Innate, transforming the way the world builds. It's now or never. Hello, project people. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Project Chatter podcast. It's always good to have you with us. And uh, we don't have Dale today, unfortunately, but we will give him a lot of flack today. Uh, Martin, good to see you, buddy. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks. And yourself? Very, very good. Thank you. And look, this is the first time I think we've actually talked about this subject matter. So let's introduce our guest today. Brendan Robinson, how are you, sir? Very well. Thanks, Val. How are you? I'm good, mate. I'm good. I'm uh, feeling a bit precious after a big night yesterday, but I am feeling good enough to talk about quant- quantity surveying and alliance contracts with you so but we always need a definition so we've not had this conversation before around this topic but what is quantity surveying from your perspective mate we may, firstly you made it sound very posh i'm not sure it's that posh but um <laughs> and and i suppose i should have a definition but i don't have a full definition but for me a quantity surveyor is part of the professional construction team on a project and they particularly focus on the cost of the project but also the contract. And they Mm. need to have quite a bit of knowledge, not only how the contract works, what obligations the parties to a contract have, maybe how to administer that contract, but also more importantly, what's the contract trying to achieve? They still need to know the goal of of the project, whatever, whatever discipline, whatever type of construction project it may be. Mm. That's a great explanation. Um, makes sense to me, man. Do it make sense to you, mate? Excellent. That was very concise. Yep, got that. What about, <laughs> and I know uh, we, we have had Glenn Hyde on about contracts, usually NECs, but what's an alliance contract? Is that different? How does that work? So an alliance contract is a little different. Um, it's, it's a little bit more modern. I can't, I can't remember when I first came across alliance contract, maybe, maybe 2016, 2017, something like that. Now, say it's a common standard form contract but it's certainly more popular and it's certainly certainly gaining popularity Mm. uh, specifically in the infrastructure sector i actually listened to the podcast with um, glenn hyde on nec contracts Mm. and nec probably has the most well-known alliance in contract Um, and i think that came out in 2018 um but I suppose the key for an alliance in contract, what makes it different to a usual contract is it's normally multi-party, probably after the same goal or a similar goal or, and generally chasing a similar incentive, often money, often, often cost. Um, And I suppose the key is in the word, it's the alignment of goals. Um, And I suppose it's a bit different to a partnership or a joint venture, which are probably more common terms and have been around for a little bit longer Mm. i think alliancing is more formal and it's a more formalized way of dealing with each other dealing with different parties to to an agreement and and maybe certainly behaviorally it's it's probably important that an alliance sets out how contract or contracted parties are expect expected to behave with each other Mm. so Mm. very good and look, a bit about yourself, mate. How did you get into QSing? Where, where did it start for you? Sure. I, I studied quantity surveying at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And I think I started in 2001. Um, always wanted to actually be in the construction industry. Watched, watched my dad do a bit of construction work. Uh, he always told me, you don't want to do anything with your hands, Brendan, because you're absolutely useless. So try and use your mind. Uh, always felt like construction is pretty outdoorsy, get out a bit. I'm not convinced I still do that, but um, I still like going out on site just as, I'm at, just as much as I did the first time I ever went onto a building site. Um, but that's, that's where it all started. Excellent. No, that's fantastic. Because, you know, sometimes I find that um, people start with a background in QSing and then they go into other ventures. But um, how long have you been doing QSing for? So best part of 20 years, I suppose, 18 years I've been a quantity surveyor. 
I, I became mm -hmm. a pre professional quantity surveyor in 2013. Basically, I got chartered. Um, more recently, I've become a fellow. That's just a bunch of letters behind your name. Um, but totally passionate about quantity surveying, still am. Thought I would do some, some legal work, actually. 2016, I did a contract law degree at King's College, and I thought maybe I want to go down the sort of mediation arbitration route, and maybe I still will. But um, when I started getting involved, I realized I couldn't do quantity surveying as much anymore. So I went straight back to default and, and I, I'm still doing quantity surveying now. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, you know, in the day-to-day -day work of a QS, you know, why is it so important to a project to have good QS practices? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> My, my lecturer, it's going, this is going right back to probably first or second year. My lecturer said without the quantity surveyor, the architect wouldn't have anyone to draw in the purse strings. The architect's always trying to design something flashy that the poor client can't afford. And um, my other lecturer said uh, the quantity surveyor is, is always in the ear of the project manager as the project manager's conscience. Mm -hmm. and, I think that is still true advice in many respects. I, I, I totally respect architects, engineers, project managers, and the, the entire construction team. But, but sometimes we're on the other side of the coin. The project manager needs to get the work done. And we're pointing out, yes, but you need to get the work done to a budget. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So... Does, does QSing also include, you know, progress and, and, and physical percent complete? I noticed that at least my interactions with QSing, it's, it's also about verification because if you, for some reason, no one trusts the PM. So there's, a, there's always a QS there, you know, being the guiding conscience um, on, on site, uh, making sure that when we count the apples, uh, that is the amount of apples and we're not overcounting, et cetera. Is that true? That is still true. That's the quantity survey is still generally responsible for reviewing the, the payment applications and, and verifying how much the, uh, the pay or how much payment should be made. Uh, mm -hmm. Glenn Hyde will point out that that's the role of the project manager under an NEC contract. But I, I haven't met a project manager yet who analyzes the costs and says what needs to be paid. So when I do, I'll, I'll make sure I let you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think it helps to have someone who one likes doing that um, and two has a little bit more time to, to get into the detail as well. Because again, it can be it can be tricky to understand where the contractors are at sometimes. Sometimes contracts are ambiguous and um, it makes it all, all a little bit more fun. It's not necessarily just counting widgets, is it? No, that's for sure. I'm, I'm almost certain that ambiguity is a must. Otherwise, the lawyers don't have a job for the future. But I, I mean, it's not easy to write a contract. My goodness, I've, I've seen some bespoke contracts over the years, which, which are in, incredibly difficult to follow. And you kind of have to unpick it and, and try and have, have a lot of difficult conversations with the client and the project team saying, you know, I, I really don't understand what, what we want out of this contract. What, what's it trying to achieve? And often I'm I, certainly the clients I deal with, I'm always going down a standard form route and rather making amendments to a contract that's tried and tested rather than, than necessarily writing your own. Mm. Do you have any favorite Z clauses that are repeatable? No, not. I mean, there, there, there have been some definite classic Z clauses. Um, I've, I've seen a, a similar Z clause that says basically the client is always right. <laughs> Um, so that, that's a that's a pretty harsh one. Um, I've seen other ones on uh, on delay, where where the client accepts no, basically no reason for causing any delay whatsoever. <laughs> um, I've certainly seen some contracts in the Middle East where the client side risk profile is very different to what we find in the common law jurisdictions like. That's, that's always a word that, that trips me up. Jurisdictions like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, England, etc., India. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a much more, um, it's a contract with maybe the risk shared a little bit more than, than I've seen in the Middle East. So I think, as, as you just said before, you, you're kind of the, the conscience of the project. You're, you're helping the project manager. You, you're probably making 
might make a few enemies at the start um, with with some of the people on site, and I imagine you worked on some pretty pretty tricky construction sites. How how do you go about getting that right working relationship with the guys? Because you know, I, I don't imagine you're going to be popular when you said there's no, you know, they can't have ten people on site instead of seven, or uh, you know, particularly I saw in your profile you, you're. Um, you, you kind of mentor a, a cohort of, of QSs and apprentices. What, what would be your advice to those guys? A fresh face going out on site, having to meet some quite tricky people on the underground. Living up to your reputation there, Martin, asking, asking the, the, the questions from, from the left side. Um, you, you definitely ruffle some feathers. Look, if, if you were holding payment and you're serving a pay less notice, and the contractor wanted a million pounds that month and they only got 350,000 pounds that month. It's highly likely that that contractor, you know, wanted it for a reason or, or there was a cash flow. But sometimes you have to, A, you have to protect the client's money at times, certainly if, if you're in that role. And, um, you know, you, you count the, we've been called bean counters or you're counting the bricks. And Simply put, if the bricklayer hasn't laid a thousand bricks, you can't pay them for a thousand bricks. And that's a hard conversation to have. I think you have to be honest. You have to be ethical. Um, the law has moved on a lot way, it, long way. It helps you with communication. You, you, know, you, can't, you can't pay when paid and things like that nowadays. It, there's a lot more, more in your favor. But be personable. Um, I, I would tell any of the the quantity surveys that I, or the budding quantity surveys that I mentor, the apprentices that I've dealt with over the years, just be true. Just go into the room and say, this is why I've withheld the money. It's only an interim payment. You pay it next month if it's done or, you know, and, or be honest on, in terms of what's missing. You know, if, if, if you're looking for a, a couple of subcontract payments that don't seem, that haven't been made or you can't see them being made, offer, offer those to be produced a week later and then maybe change the payment cert if that's in your power to do so. But, but definitely start on, on the right foot and be personable. I mean, con construction industry is combative enough as it is. It doesn't, you, you don't need to go there bashing your fist on the first day. So you know, communicate well, set it up well. Do, do you almost want communication on top of, detail like would you tell them just you know be detailed straight away get that get that right level of detail and being meticulous or do you try and almost win fate win the favor of the people in your teams the guys on site the guys and girls sorry um on site is it is it better to almost start start with the detail the concepts or would you almost encourage them to to, to get that persona but to almost focus almost too much on communication I, I focus a lot on communication. I mean, one of my biggest bug bearers in the industry and in, in, in we work, I, I'm generally based on infrastructure projects. That's my experience. Yeah. So um, airports, shopping centers, big railway stations, railway extensions. That, that's, that's my cup of tea. And I'm so tired of seeing works information in a contract that's 15,000 pages long because it's just a real... You know, the, the client wants everything and you never get everything. And it would be so much more realistic if you just ask the contractor for the information you want. Yeah. So be concise. You know, you don't want their entire accounts records for the last five years. Um, that, that is definitely starting on the wrong foot. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't detailed and analytical. And um, there is a balance. So you, you do need that personal in interaction. You do need to set the right behaviors. It's, it's certainly the biggest improvement I've seen in contracts in my 18 years in construction is the behaviors are better nowadays. People are more approachable. People talk to each other more. And that's so important. Collaborative contracts are, you know, they are the future. You know, alliance in contracts, I really do believe they are the future. The, the old confrontation from day one is, is out the door. And, and I'm, I'm very pleased to have seen that change a little bit in my, in my time. Um, but there is still confrontation. And <laughs> when, when money is involved, and, and going back to what I said, when you withhold money for a reason that you think is completely valid, you need to be honest and you need to be personable. 
and you need to understand the impact that has. So, uh, absolutely, it's, it's good advice. I, I think you kind of answered my next question there. What what has kind of changed over that twenty years you've been involved in in infrastructure projects? Is it is it mostly the behaviours? Is there any kind of technicals that's changed? Obviously, a little bit of technology, probably how you manage the contract over your, yeah, your kind of commercial tools. Change. But but is there anything anything else you you think has changed or? Contract administration has come a long way. I mean, you used to write instructions on a piece of paper or um, <laughs> we used to do a hell of a lot of emailing and contract management software tools have changed a lot. They're, they're often a one source of truth. They're guaranteed delivery of when the communication happens and, and they really help administer, you know, pretty advanced contracts across a, a wide spectrum of requirements. Um, I think it's got, I think you go on site a little bit less. Um, it's maybe it's maybe a bit more paperwork heavy, but but obviously that paperwork is online. Uh, there are more meetings than I've ever seen before. So that's probably more of a downside. Um, but contract improvement is is another one which I think I have to mention. So I'd say contract administration and the way the contracts are written. The, these big bodies, FIDEC. Uh, JCT, JBCC in South Africa, ICE, you know, you, you, don't, you don't develop these contracts over 30 years to get worse. They get better and better. They figure out more problems that contracting parties have. They try and get more parties in the room. They try and specify meetings that help avoid contract dispute. I mean, the, the dispute avoidance machinery in a contract now, certainly the, the, the most common standard form contracts are better than ever. So yeah, I'll stick to that. Contract admin and, and better contracts have, have made a big change in 20 years. Nice, you, you kind of had me thinking there. So when you're saying you, you particularly working in infrastructure projects, how, how did it work during the pandemic where you, you obviously could go on site even less than you could before you know obviously for things like design where you can sort of see see a product online you can visualize it but you know how many you know what percentage of you installed tested that that must be a lot harder for you to kind of verify to get that real information how did the qs industry in infrastructure construction projects how did they manage during the pandemic you must well, have had to take a few people's word <laughs> you, you do take a few people's word um, luckily, there's generally some dispensation for certain roles that have to be on site. Site managers, project managers certainly visited site more than the quantity surveying team and the commercial team. Um, I probably went on site once a month instead of once every two days, which for me is probably unheard of on most of the projects I've worked. But it also changed the industry. Um, I don't want to dwell on on the pandemic, it was probably a tough time for many people, including myself. Um, but, you know, on my current project, we, we just signed a contract for, for drone updates. The project I'm on is so big. The length of track mm. is so large that, um, you know, we have a drone that's going to track a lot of progress on, on, a, on a weekly basis. You can't just have a time-lapse video with the old video on the best tile crane on site, you know, it's now maybe a time lapse with a with a couple of drones, and and there are there are companies set up to do that. So, I think think tech moved a long way very quickly in the pandemic. Nothing speeds up something like that. I suppose it's easy to say in hindsight, but yes, the, people grab that opportunity and go. Well, there's now a, an industry for cameras on hard hats on the project manager to show the QS what's happening that day. Um, also, records have moved a long way. You know, when I first started out, you, you would count how many bricklayers were on site that day and it would go in the site diary. Now there is systems and, and turnstiles and gates that do that. I'm sure there are small projects who still count how many bricklayers there are on site and how many bricks were laid that day. But, but on a bigger infrastructure project, that's, you know, that's not a priority. It's, it's a different level. Uh, that's really interesting, mate. I th I, one of the other th questions I've got is is around um, just general practice. So my, I can only talk about QSs with my experience, you know, and and uh, it's always been great because I feel like that 
the QS role is an interesting one from, from our perspective looking in, because I'm a PMO project controls background. So I feel like QSing is a little bit of project controls. There's a little bit of independent assurance. It's a little bit of contract management. It's a little bit of finance. Um, it's, it's actually quite a, a little bit of estimating cost engineering. It's a little bit of everything. And, um, and it's kind of like a fusion role. So it's not just a one role. So I can see why people would like to do that as a career because it is quite an all rounder role. Is that a good description of, from your perspective? Yes, I think you've done a great job there. You know, when, when I sit in a room with a city apprentices wanting to join a company and, and start an apprenticeship to be a quantity surveyor, those, those are the types of things I tell them because they still ring true. Mm. Uh, the, the title of today is, you know, is, is quantity surveying dying? You know, I would have challenged you and said just the opposite. Quantity surveying is thriving. Um, mm. Clients want quantity surveyors to get more and more involved. A lot of what you said there, Val, is quite particular. I'm, I'm a post-contract quantity surveyor. I generally work after the contract is signed. Mm -hmm. um, I generally work on change, compensation event, you know, the drawdown of contingency or because a risk has materialized. That, that's my bag, a bit of negotiation as well. But as you said, there are so many facets to being a quantity surveyor. You can be pre-contract. You can be a specialist in NEC contracts. You can just do contract admin. That's all you do. Every day, you make sure that the parties are answering their obligations in the time period that the, the standard form contract, if one is used, says you have to. Um, it's, it's incredibly diverse. And, and I, do, I do say that to, to the apprentices that I've dealt with over, over the years. Yeah, that's great. And um, I guess with, the, with all that knowledge and moving parts um i know that finance love excel but is excel a favorite tool of qs's as well <laughs> if if dale was here i would banter so i'm <laughs> going to pretend dale is here Dale would be the first to say i've got to be one of the few quantity surveyors who's pretty rubbish at excel <laughs> and i i often tell princes not not only my princes my colleagues that you do not need to run a construction job through through excel yes it helps and of course i can mm. i can do the basics on excel and maybe a bit more but um really you can't you can't negotiate a variation on excel you can't tell if the variation is priced accurately on excel you often have to get someone in the room, get Val in the room and say, Val, why have you put that money there? Why have you said mm. that you are removing 25 tons of steel and putting in 40 tons of steel because of this design change that, that the client's designer has, has made on site? What, what's, what's the reasoning? Show me on the drawing. Show me how it's moved. Maybe you don't show it on the drawing. Nowadays, you have them, mm. you know, you have, Mm. 3d 4d 5d software that can show you how the, con the the steel has come out and what steel has now gone in why it's a change but you still need to have that discussion it can't it can't be done off a spreadsheet um but there is definitely a place for spreadsheets and and i i think that'll be around for a while yet yeah i, I agree with you i think the malleability of it to do it on site and in situ means that it's um it's very very useful um but is there are there go-to tools for qsing because it's out of my my depth of knowledge but when you when you think about best practice or good practice at least where do the qs's go is there a, a forum or a, a standard practice of tools systems processes yeah so so there's often a measurement kit and the the, the royal institute of chartered surveys is a good place to start they're probably the not probably they are the world leader in terms of qs's um, they have 150,000 plus members around, around the world. Um, but what, what they do is they publish a lot of, of guidance and their rules of measurement are often the rules of measurement that are stipulated in a contract. So you would have maybe the engineering rules for measurement or mechanical and electrical piping as a different way to measure. And again, it's trying to reduce that conflict because, you know, the... The new rules of measurement will tell you that when you measure paint in a room, you measure it in square meterage. And you, mm -hmm. and, but when you measure paint around a window, you measure that in meters because it's more intricate work. It, it needs to be priced slightly differently. 
And, and there are a lot of rules, as you can imagine. Steel is done in tonnage. Concrete is done in cubic meters. Formwork, to put the concrete up, is done in square meters. These are rules that don't really change, but they do get updated. And mm -hmm. certainly the, the, the descriptions for how the work is done gets changed. And, and that database, or uh, here everyone asks me if I'm crazy when I say database, that database of information has certainly grown over, mm. over the 20 years that, that I've been around. Well, this is where I think that, you know, is QSing dead? I think what they mean, because we talk about planners and project controls, don't we, Martin, where we say, well, are they dead? Because technology is obviously so much more advanced than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, but I think what we mean, we don't mean the, the role. I think what we mean is the role is changing. So we've still got these old titles like QSing, project controls, um, planning. But I think the roles themselves are becoming a bit more of a fusion role and there's more to be involved. And I think what we're saying is in that role, some of the transactional work that you may have done in the past will be made redundant because we won't need to do that, which is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, is that your understanding of QSing as well? Absolutely. So I'm just, as you were talking, I'm running through an example. Uh, you, get a, you get something called a bill of quantities, right? Mm -hmm. I probably mm -hmm. haven't seen a bill of quantities in 15 years because why really why does a client want to spend quite a bit of capital getting a quantity surveying company or what was the old school quantity surveying companies to sit there and do a takeoff of every brick, every bit of paint, every skirting, every pile, count it all up, put it in a massive schedule and then send that out to the contractors to price. You now have software that does that. You have approximate quantities because do you really need to know the specific quantity right to the nth degree? Mm. And you have, you have quantities or approximate quantities that align to the procurement route you've chosen. So, you know, for a design and build contract, the level of detail that you get from a contractor in a price is very different to a traditional form of contract. And that's purely because it's a different risk profile. You know, as a, as a client on a traditional, you hold a bit more risk in terms of the design that your design team has created. So you probably want to get the quantities a bit, bit more tight. You want to mm. know how much brickwork there is to do on your project. And when you're assessing the procurement or the, the tender returns, you want to be able to analyze that. But on a design and build, if you know nothing about construction and you're a I don't know, you're Google wanting to build a head office, probably a bad example because they are building a head office in King's Cross. You, you often want a design and build contractor to come on board and, and, and that tender might be more based on what they can achieve for you, what the outcome is, the amazing office that they can produce, the amazing designs that their architects can produce. So mm -hmm. It's a different feel and it's come a long way. Yeah, that was interesting because I'm one of the when you were just talking there, I was thinking about probably the the integration of QSing, and I'm I'm speaking for Australia. I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but uh, we're finding more and more, particularly on alliance contracts um, and rail projects in particular, Brendan. They I'm not understanding the relationship between QSing or maybe cost engineering and project controls and planning because they're not resource or cost loading schedules. So you're not getting time materials or any quantities into the program. So there's a misalignment straight up. And it's not apparent to me that we have a robust QS system that is controlling that. So in the absence of having that integration, have you seen that on projects in your previous experience or how do they get around that? I definitely have. I'm honestly not just, I really had this conversation today with, uh, with a member of the procurement team. And I was saying that when we get tender returns on the project I'm currently working on, please, 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 in your evaluation, ensure that the, the, the price or the cost aligns to the program and that you can see it to a relative detail. I'm not mm -hmm. saying, you know, you will know this better than me. And, and Dale, Dale is ringing in my ear saying maybe everything should be to a level four detail. I'm not <laughs> saying that maybe a level one or a level two detail, yep. but but you need to be able to see the, the program bar and what costed activities that relates to 
And you need to be able to tell what that cost is, what, what the planned expenditure is. And really, for me, that's true on any procurement route. It doesn't matter if you're doing this, a lump sum contract or a fixed price or a target adjustment contract. That, that really is, is the basic. You need to know what your price is based on. Mm. So what do you say to, to programs, mega programs um, that don't have that resource loaded um, kind of a comparative view that would integrate with QS? I, I say you need to get it. And that's not an easy task. Um, mm. Sometimes it takes a lot of time in a room. You know, some, sometimes you take a chance, you get a variation. Let's say that variation is 5 million pounds, quite a, quite a large scale variation. And the detail is like half a page. You know, I, I get the quantity survey in the room and I say, can you bring the planner? Can you bring someone from, from project controls? Can you bring the project manager? Please explain to me how that 5 million is broken up. You know, what, what program bars does it relate to? Are you setting up a new bar? You know, is it, are you putting a variation and a compensation event as a new bar on your program? Or are you amending existing bars? No, what, you you got to talk talk it through, um, and and often the engineer as well. What what's changing in the spec? What what's changing in the design? Yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah, exactly. that's interesting because it's quite high level what you just said there. You know, for the tender bids, you, I, I'd almost expect a QS to actually want to see those details. You know, you've got a ten thousand square meters of X to to do, or you know, I actually want to see that. You know, a hundred widgets that you need to install or uh, what it sounds like is it's almost evolving into something that's quite high level as long as you can say you know you've got a general handle on the concept and it's you're not taking a piss with with what you're trying to do in your schedule it's okay is, is that is that fair or is it more about the longer term game i think it is about the longer term but it, it depends on your procurement reach so if if the client is taking the risk on quantities you want to write it's their design. If, if it's a design and build contract, I'm not convinced you need that level of accuracy. Certainly not all the time. But, but when it comes to variations and when it, when it comes to the expenditure of more money, I, doesn't, variation is, is probably, it's the right term, but it's wider than that. It can be, it can be anything. Look, you can be delayed on site. That's going to have an impact on cost. Right, mm. and that's going to have an impact on program. You, you you want to know the detail for that. You you will always need to know the detail for that. And certainly, if you get into a dispute, that detail is critical. You need you need the records. But but what I'm saying is, I I don't want to see a variation for half a page for for five million pounds. But equally, I don't want to see the kitchen sink with a five million pound var variation. No? There's a balance. So you we were talking about technology before. We, maybe this is something that will help uh, future projects. Like you mentioned, BIM 5D, 4D, um, you know, model-based planning, some of these automated routes with a bit of machine learning. Do you see that kind of being the big lift for, for QSing in terms of your ability to probably export out faster or be more closely aligned to the program and the contract? I hope so, Val. I haven't seen it moving as fast as I would like. Yeah. Maybe four or five years ago, I was sitting at a conference for a couple of hours and I was extremely engaged. It, it is hands down one of the best conferences I've ever been to. And the, the BIM software being produced, I can't remember if it was Brava based or AutoCAD based or where, where it came from. Those, those are specifics. But it, the, the simulation was on piling and love piling. I wrote a, a dissertation on it when I was at university. I wrote a dissertation on the difference between secant piles and contiguous piles. So you can talk to me about piling forever. But anyway, this showed the foundation underneath a stadium. It was a London-based stadium. So you probably got about six of the big football clubs. So it's one of the new ones. Then I'll narrow it down. So what it did is it showed you the 850 piles. I can't remember all the specifics. 850 piles under the stadium. You could then click on the model, drill down into it and click one of the piles, right? And then up would pop that pile. On the right-hand side, you've got a link to the specification, tell you what concrete goes in, 
into the making of that particular pile. Um, how many cubic meters of concrete it takes to fill up that pile in the ground. Is it a CFA pile, the type of pile, the drawings, the elevations, um, even the coordination of where that pile sits relative to the other piles. That is immense tech, but I've never seen it on a project in practice. Mm. And why? I'll be controversial. It's because the construction industry moves at a snail pace. People don't like change. They're used to, they're used to the way they're doing things. But personally, I think BIM models, and imagine the power of that same set where you show it to the client and you say, right, I've allowed in my price to do all 800 of those piles, exactly how it's set. And then um, the client goes, well, I want to build another, say, another two buildings adjacent to the stadium to hold my special guests for, for each, each home match. Well, you can show that on the model. You, you build it in. You, you have a, a 5D, a 6D representation of what that is. And, and when I say 60, I remember the exact same simulation. So now two hours later in the seminar where they were talking about the heating and ventilation of the stadium. And they showed the comfort cooling units and the condensers that run the mechanical and electrical ventilation systems, the cooling. And, um, you know, you could click on this model, you could click on the installed Hitachi air conditioning unit, and it would tell you when that needs a gas change, when it needs a service. Now that is six dimensional BIM because it's going into operational and maintenance phase. Mm -hmm. But I still haven't seen that in practice on a project that, I'm, that I've worked on. But yet yeah. I can see so many benefits of that particular tech. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think from, from all of us, we, we just want something that plays nice across all the disciplines. Um, we find that if you, if you go to market, the software companies obviously try to find a niche and they build to the niche because obviously it's cost effective and it would do a job, but it can't do all the jobs. And then you have companies, I'm not, I'm not digging at software companies, but I kind of am. And, and then you'll have software companies that bring out a suite of tools, um, but you have to purchase all of them and they aren't quite ready for, for kind of public consumption or they don't quite work for the disciplines that they say they do. So they're, they're kind of not quite there. As you said, construction's a little bit behind in that space. Um, by, that, by that means though, I think the UK is far, far ahead of Australia. Um, sorry, Australia. But uh, we need to look at the UK and learn as much as possible, particularly in the QSing, project controls, and project management space, um, and technology. Where you know you you do have um, pretty robust contracts. We don't really use NEC here, um, and we don't really, you know, I just mentioned we don't even resource load schedules on multi-billion-dollar projects, and I just don't know how you cannot do that. Um, I won't mention the projects that I'm on right now, Brendan, but there are some projects there where I, I just say. Imagine being a QS on that project. I'm just thinking in, in terms of imagine being Brendan on that project and understanding, right, what does the program say? What does the contract say? And what, what am I trying to do? And trying to get a sense of where we are, where we're going and what we need to claim. Um, that would be a difficult task, yeah? Hugely difficult, almost impossible. Mm. But the project director will still ask you to do it. That's for certain. <laughs> you sound like you've been uh, there before. <laughs> I've definitely been there before. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very painful experience. If, well, if you don't get those basics right, you are really in for a struggle. Mm. Well, that, that brings us to contracts, right? Because I think you were talking about it and we, we kind of mentioned a bit of a definition of alliances, but contracts in general um, really allow us to have a safe place to um, collaborate and inquire and make good transactions in what they used to call good faith, but they don't do all in the spirit of collaboration, which is always a, a comical term, but it means the right thing. The intent is right, I think, in some of these contracts, and particularly NECs, because I, you know, I worked in the UK. I thought, you know, they had the right formula there, and it's evolved as I've as I watched it. And um, Glenn Hyde's great. I mean, he he has been fantastic, and uh, we've had him on numerous times. But the alliance contracts, in terms of your experience, I mean, how does that work um, from a transactional perspective? I get the kind of contract overview. You know, it's 
a, a number of entities or bodies working together to collaborate on a common incentive and goal. And there's some reward if they all work together collaboratively, that makes sense. Um, but how does it work from your perspective? It, it's a tough question. I mean, alliancing is still relatively new, but it's got to come down to those behaviors. It, it has to. That, that's the spirit behind that, that contract. It's, it's removing that adversity. It's, you, you said the common goal there, and I know that that's a catchphrase. That's, you know, alliancing, there's the catchphrase. You know, it's a common goal. Let's all work together. Let's collaborate. But you have to want to do that. And the behavior is what needs to show that. So let's try and, let's try and have a behavior in an alliance. Let's simulate it. So Val Contractors Limited is being delayed by Martin Contractors Limited. What would Val normally do? If phone up the client, write the client a, 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 a harsh notice and say, please pay me more money. I can't come to site. I can't do my work because Martin should have finished, Martin contractors and it should have finished their work and, and I can't start. Mm. Right. That's traditional. So that's, that's a traditional form of contract. The client's managing two separate contracts. The client takes the risk of that. The alliance model says you can't do that behavior. It says you can't tell Martin that he, that Martin's delayed because there's, you know, if you, if you look at a very advanced alliance, there might not be a delay clause in the contract. You're barking up the wrong tree. You have no entitlement to try and get that money because there is no way you can delay Martin if there's not a term in the contract that says you mustn't delay Martin. So mm. you, Martin Contractors Limited and Val Contractors Limited have a behavioral obligation in an alliance contract to work together to solve that problem. So it might be, hey, th this is how the narrative might change. It might be, Val, slow down your work in that area so that you don't clash with Martin in six weeks' time because Martin is behind in that area. And by the way, Martin's ahead of you in another area and is waiting for you to complete some works. So maybe Martin will slow down a bit there and, tell, and, and Val, you should speed up. Mm. And that's the symbiotic relationship. That's the, you know, you're from Australia. That's the Amora fresh attached to the shark. Yeah, that, that, that's how the alliance needs to work. But those behaviors are not easy because the entrenched behavior is to phone the client and say, your problem, your contract is delayed, pay me more money to sit and do nothing because I can't, I can't put my towel crane up because there's no concrete slab. At mm. the outset of these types of contracts, do they know how much each other is making in terms of margin? How open are they? Mm. And kind of using that example, the, the thing that I'm trying to get my head around thinking as a more a contractor than a client here is you, you must have things for your internal reporting that you wouldn't want to share with the, with the alliance. You, you should share, but you just don't want to because it will make you look bad commercially. Let's, let's just go with that maybe you've totally screwed up something that is causing that delay, so, something like that. We, we've all probably been there as, uh, as, as contractors. H how honestly open are you on those kind of things? Like, do, would partner one know how much partner two, what percentage they're making off this job or, or what their markup is on certain resources? How open is I open, I think, is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to sit on the fence because I don't want splinters in my backside. Um, a true alliance, if, if you wanted the purest view, it probably should be very open on that. And you, you should, should you, you might not share your profit margin. You might not say that you're making 15%, right? But you do want to share what the financial gain is for all of the members in the alliance. And you want to understand like that. So I, that, that's often a difference between a partnership or a joint venture and the alliance. In the joint venture, you pursue your own goals. And you, you know, that's why a lot of joint ventures have a lot of friction between the two parties. The alliance should try and avoid that. That is exactly what you're trying to contract out of in an alliance. But I don't think you need to be, I, I don't think that needs to go to the nth degree because how many touch points do you have? Let's say you're the contractor who's holding the, 
the superstructure and the cladding, but the other alliance member is doing the fit out and the other alliance member is doing the foundations. You need to be honest on the touch points. You don't need to be honest on everything you're doing. Yeah. I think that, in, that's still up to you. So, so, so what you said there is rightly the the aim, the the kind of theoretical, maybe the wrong word. In in practice, does that happen? From I know it's a relatively new concept. In, in your experience, have you seen those kind of good behaviours, or do they try and get some bad ones in there? So, so I was on a major infrastructure project for five years. So pretty much from when the project started to when the keys get handed over. And, and you can start using this lovely piece of infrastructure. And the first two years were rough. We spoke about those times in a room that it gets tough. They were rough. And we didn't have an alliance agreement. We didn't have a partnering agreement. It was a typical client um, role, but, but with a joint venture contractor. And what we did, and, and I'm not going to, to say this was me because it wasn't. It was, a, it was a decision probably above my pay grade. But what I learned from it, is that they signed a behavioral charter to cut out the behaviors that were causing the problems on the project. And there was one person who didn't want to sign it, I'm not going into names, but that person was removed from the project because what they were looking for was an agreement from the joint venture contractors and the client to say, this is how we're going to do business for the next three years. Mm. And when you sat in a meeting, you would look up on the wall and that statement signed by everyone, signed by my boss, as an example, was right there in your face saying, this is not how we're going to act because otherwise this project is not going to get finished. It's not going to be affordable. You know, and so, so I have seen that work in practice, not in an official lines capacity. And the current bespoke alliance I'm looking at has, has an immense amount of machinery that in theory can work very well. But I said, it to, I said it to Bell earlier, you have to practice what you preach. You can't, you can't write it down and not do it. It needs to work for everyone and, and you need to tweak it as you go along. It, it's a big, big strength of the NEC Alliance Agreement. They have the integrated pro program and they have the integrated team. So the alliance members and the client share roles in an integrated team. There's not a he said, she said attitude. She said, he said attitude. There's a we are a team. We make decisions together that are best for our project. And that is a term that I'm seeing in, in more and more alliance agreements that I've looked at. Or the, the more, I, the, you know, sometimes I do a little bit of Googling on it or a bit of research and you know, it, it does have to be a best for project decision. It needs to be something that makes it work. And, and that, that behavior or that aspect is critical in alliance. It's ultimately about getting the job done and, and delivering mm -hmm. on what you said you were doing in your contract. Um, you just made me think of one thing. It's one of Val's favorite subjects as well. Concurrent delays. How, how does that get managed in, in these types of contracts? And I'm sure you're going to. Well, if you've got that. no delay clauses, you can't have concurrent delay. One way around it. Mm. <laughs> so think, think about that. Can you have a construction project where the client doesn't put an astronomical amount in the delay damages clause? Um, I'm sure I'm not a lawyer. Um, but I'm sure if you pulled some of the best construction lawyers in the country onto this call, they would point out how few times delay damages are successful. Mm. It's not a, you know, I, I, I would go out on a limb and as a guest, I'd say one in 10 claims for delay damages work because half the time the client over egged the delay damages in the first place. So the other legal counsel argues that it was never fair in the first place. Then you argue that, well, it doesn't have to be fair in a contract. You signed it. It said you're going to pay a hundred thousand pounds in damages every day. But what am I, what am I delaying? You know, what, what's an easy way to represent that? Do you have a block of flats? The client wants to sell the properties or rent the properties out. So every day that the block is not open, to charge you delay damages, the contract to delay damages of a hundred thousand pounds because that's what they would get in rental. Well, what happens if they haven't rented any of the flats out? Mm. No delay damage. 
That's, that's simply a penalty. And legal counsel would argue it's just a penalty, which, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think penalties are allowed. You can't penalize someone in, in contract. It's, it's, a, it's a different aspect of the law. I'm sure there are ways to fight that. But you know, yeah. I, it goes, goes back to delay damages are not, they're not highly successful every time. That is for sure. Yeah, just on that as well, I think for my final question around that is, is you know, you mentioned like, a, let's say, it's a, yeah, generically one in 10, but it the amount of effort and volume, some of these variations and alliances, and, you know, you see a little bit of bamboozling when you're seeing the contractors push all these through. But if the return isn't, you know, I'm looking at it from a return investment of effort and energy and success rates. If the success rate is like one in 10, surely that's not good to pursue and i guess it's you know the contracts are set up that way so that you don't have all these claims but and they're not successful but why do they push so many claims if they aren't going to get a return yeah or well, certainly less return less return yeah yeah it's it's very often that the variation is a hundred thousand pounds but by the end of it's negotiated at twenty thousand pounds that's that that's yeah. probably a common occurrence do that very badly in my experience because they try and push too hard it's not required you need, you need to come to a midpoint the contractor needs to make money and and you need to tell the client that but i suppose they push it foul because contractors get in trouble sometimes you've you know what happens mm. if you've bought a job you've gone in on a low tender because you you don't have a lot of work on you know now you've got to push claims because that's your only way of meeting your margin well, that's actually a really good point, Brendan. That was where I was kind of thinking because I know there's a, this BAFO stage from a bid perspective, right? And I've seen a lot of projects, even big tier companies. We've seen some big firms in Australia go bust over the last couple of years, but COVID was obviously a factor. But um, one of the other factors is that, you know, we there's competition. And when there's competition, the government um, does a good job at getting this BAFO stage in place. And then people make cuts. So the original bid plan is not the actual program. And then when you start the program, you're already in the red. And then the idea is to get back in the black. So how do you do that? And the mechanism for that under most contracts is some type of variation or scope change or whatever it is. Um, is that your experience as well? It's absolutely my experience. But it's another thing that's moved on in the 20 years that I've been a QA. The first job I ever worked on a tender for was in 2004. It was a three million pound block of flats. And I put the price together, um, obviously with support. I, I, was, I wasn't on my own. And um, you know, I can't remember everything off the heart, but let's say that figure was 2.9 million. That's what we wanted to go put our tender in at. And I went to what is called a tender review meeting where the directors of the company sit there and you pitch your bid and you say, I'm happy with it. And I've got all these mm -hmm. prices back and I've, I've gone in with a 15% margin and I've snuck a bit of money somewhere else. And we want to put the bid in for 2.9. And my director, Paul, I won't say his last name. He went, no, Brendan, we'll put the bid in at 2,400,000. I'm like, where'd we cut the 550,000 pounds from? Obviously, I, I'm not quiet. I tend to ask those questions in meetings. And Paul simply said, he was, he was direct and honest. He said, we don't have a lot of work on not making a lot on a couple of projects that we have on this year. We need this win. We need this project. We did win that project and we struggled. And it was my mm. job as the QS to claw that money back. So I'm under pressure from the first day that I'm on that project. And so is the project manager and so is the project team. And we're about to put the client under the pressure because the first whiff of a change we get from the client to architect, we are all over that like flies on the proverbial that is that is our bread and butter we're out there to get you thank you very much you open mm. the door we'll bring the forklift through and, and crush the door for you but that has changed May, maybe not changed as much as i wish it had um and and maybe val you and martin have seen that or, or maybe you would agree that you've seen improvements but it's still there mm. it, it doesn't yeah, matter definitely. if you're a small or a large organization that Mm. buying work is still out there yeah 100 percent. 
100 brendan well look we are wrapping it up but uh, i know martin has one more pop quiz for you a special of the episode uh martin over to you yeah just before we go we we normally do a little pop quiz with our um with our guests um so it's a section called fiverr five quick fire questions all about yourself so if you're ready let's make a start fire away martin okay number one what's your one piece of advice for people new to the project profession enjoy it make the most of it nice biggest misconception about quantity surveying that we're all boring and just look at the computer screen all day (laughs) (laughs) same point of controls Uh, number three a good leader is born or made both some some are natural some can make it (laughs) good answer uh number four what would be your book recommendation to our listeners thinking outside of the box nice and finally if you had your time again would you go straight into qs in different part of construction site something more legal engineering a and other i would have been a civil engineer civil engineer nice okay nice very good well, look, uh, thank you, Brendan, for your time, mate. Um, for the listeners there, is there any final thoughts you would like to leave them with? Um, I'm pretty open, so come and find me on LinkedIn if you ever want to ask a question. I'm a bit like Glenn Hyde. I, I still ask Glenn Hyde questions on the NEC all the time, and I've been using the NEC for 15 years. So don't be shy. Mm. Um, drop, drop me a line on, on LinkedIn. Look me up. Brendan Robinson, there's not that many of us around. Um, for the for the QSs out there, just if if any QSs are listening, I hope or or do listen. I I I hope that they pursue their dreams of becoming a quantity surveyor because it is so varied. It is is really fun. I really enjoy being a quantity surveyor. Of course, there's times I don't enjoy my job, but the uh, you know total total predominant factor is that I really enjoy what I do. And, and that's what they should do. Well said, Brendan. Well said. Uh, Martin, any final thoughts to you? No, I really enjoyed the last hour and really enjoyed the section, particularly on the, the kind of tips and tricks for, for people joining the profession. Um, some, some really good stuff there and, and really interested about how, how the kind of industry's changed over the last 20 years. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for your time. Absolutely. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for you. If you like what you heard, you can pay it forward by sharing a link to the episode or, or on social media. A massive thank you to Brendan Robinson and thank you all for listening. Till next time we say, stay safe, be disruptive and have fun doing it. From me and Martin, it's bye for now.